However, in this enrolled bill now, it has uh, widened its scope. So we find a little bit uh, broad, overly broad and vague. So uh, number one observation is that it, it, it violates principle of legality, which is present in the International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which, which uh, mandates that provisions of law imposing criminal liability must be clear and precise to ensure that it is not subject to interpretation that may unduly broaden the scope of the prohibited act. In the HSA, although it's still problematic, it identifies the acts. But here, uh, uh, it engages in acts that would endanger the life, uh, it would cause uh, uh, physical injury, among other matters that were discussed as uh, prohibited acts. These are acts that are already prohibited by our revised penal code. But adding some flavor to it is that uh, adding some flavor as mentioned on, on the purposes, then it becomes an act of terrorism. So it's overly broad and vague that thus it does not afford notice on what is specific conduct uh, to avoid. So uh, being, being such, uh, it has an issue on, on due process because if you are to impose a, a criminal, uh, apart from violation of the principle of legality, it has something to do with the right to due process because uh, a person or a citizen must know what are the acts, exact acts by, with precision that he has to avoid or is being prohibited by law. And number two, it leaves to law enforcers quite a wide discretion in implementing the provisions. Second observation, it has removed the definition as it is right now, has removed the political or ideological motive, which was found in the Human Security Act. Uh, they say, proponents would say, it's because it, they want to address the present uh, condition of terrorism or, or the various ways terrorism is uh, being done in, in the world today. Okay, so uh, in HSA, the motive is to so create condition of fear in order to coerce the government to give in to an unlawful demand. We know that there is no uniform definition in international in, in the international community of what the terrorism is. But the deletion of the political or ideological motive made uh, the definition in the present uh, uh, anti-terrorism bill to be to be broad. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, in the definition, it identifies the exceptions, which proponents would say that uh, say is a safeguard to uh, and to to, uh, to to the specific rights uh, to uh, of the Filipinos, particularly in the the, free, in the area of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and freedom to assemble. So it accepts advocacy protests, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass action, and other similar exercises of civil and political rights. However, the exception is being qualified by the following phrase, which are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person, to endanger a person's life, or to create a serious risk to public safety. It could have been, for, for our, in our opinion, it could have been better if this is not, if this is not placed such that uh, it is ex it explicitly, the law would explicitly exempt uh, the exercise of civil and political rights. So in our, our opinion, it's not a safe a safeguard to uh, misuse and abuse uh, the definition of terrorism. Next slide. Okay. Now, in sections 5 to 12 of uh, the anti-terrorism bill, it an identifies some other forms of crimes. A threat to terrorism, to planning, training, preparing, and facilitating the commission of terrorism. Third, conspiracy to commit terrorism. Fourth, proposal to commit terrorism. Fifth, inciting to commit terrorism. 
recruitment to and members in a terrorist organization. Uh, my personal concern is uh, why the word planning is present uh, in number two, or that is in section six. Planning, training, preparing, and facilitating. Are these acts considered as one or a planning per se of a commission of terrorism, a punishable act? Because planning without even having to be expressed in overt acts are in the realm of the, of the mind. How can a, a law punish uh, a, uh, a something, a reality, a mental reality that hasn't been expressed to overt acts? Now, uh, number two would be uh, on the membership, uh, recruitment and membership in a terrorist organization. Uh, in, in the Philippines, there are uh, groups that tag to be uh, terrorists who are recruiting uh, members, uh, specifically in far-flung areas. But they, they, they are not quite aware or there, there, are, there are fraud in, in trying to convince them to, to become a member of their organization. I think this one is not addressed by the present law. It does not exempt uh, those who were fraudulently recruited on, on fraudulent uh, right an invitation. For instance, you go for instance to, to uh, a uh, particular rally and uh, you're considered a member, but you were, you were invited just because there might be some gifts to be provided. But this one, uh, there's, there's a safeguard put in place by law. Now, on inciting to commit terrorism, uh, there will be a chilling effect to the freedom of expression of his speech and of the press because his speech may even be considered as an act of engaging in terrorism. Okay. It depends upon how the law enforcers would interpret uh, the provision on terrorism and the, those crimes that were defined in sections 5 to 12. Now, the dangers now lies on how government would interpret legitimate dissent or opposition. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, on surveillance on section 18, it states, a law enforcement agent, police, now military also is not included here. It used to be police only. May upon written order of the Court of Appeals, secretly wiretap over here and listen to, interpret, screen, read, surveil, record or collect with the use of any mode, form, record or uh, form, kind or type of electronic, mechanical or other equipment or device or technology now known or may after be known to science or with the use of any other suitable ways and means for the above purposes. Any private communication, uh, discussions, data, information, messages in whatever form, kind or torture, is spoken or written words between members of judicially declared and outlawed terrorist organization. We would come to that later on. As provided in section 26 of this act, between members of designated person as defined in Section 3E of Republic Act 10168, that's on, on the AMLA law, or any other person charged with or suspected of committing any of the crimes defined and penalized under the provision of this act. Provided the surveillance, interception, and recording of communication between lawyers, clients, doctors, and patients, journalists, and, other and their sources, and confidential business correspondents shall not be authorized. Uh, yeah, these are the privileged communications. The, 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 the enumerations and exceptions are the privileged communications. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, surveillance allows law enforcement agents to conduct surveillance on suspected terrorists through, to, to in, through the interception and recording of their private communications. And there may be unscrupulous access to persons' confidential information in violation of the right under our Bill of Rights Section 2 on unreasonable searches and seizure. Okay. This is offensive to the right also of right to self-incrimination. It even paves the way for fishing expedition that violate the right against unreasonable searches and seizure. If there is authority given to police or military, it should not take the police more than a couple of days to conduct the wiretapping and get the necessary evidence. Well, of course, we take this as a uh, as uh, a violation on, on, on wiretapping and also unresolvable searches and seizure. Well, given, given the circumstances, will we say that uh, uh, rights are not absolute rights, they can be derogated upon. But the derogation of this right should be uh, for a legitimate purpose, 
that should be necessary and proportionate. Uh, it should be provided for, uh, uh, follows the, uh, the, the, the principle of legality, and it should not be discriminative. In this instance, uh, we, we were just, uh, uh, we just observed that the 30 days has been extended to 60 days, and then another 30 days. So all in all, you, a person suspected to be terrorist, can be wired up for a period of a total of 90 days. Okay. There's also a authority to pry into bank accounts, a maximum of six months, and unlock and freeze within the period of 20 days without any court order. This is quite repugnant to the applicable laws on bank secrecy. Next slide, please. On the designation of terrorist individuals, group of persons, organizations under Section 25, it says, the ATC may designate an individual, groups or persons, organization or association, whether domestic or foreign, upon finding of probable cause that the individual groups of persons, organization or association commit or attempt to commit or conspire in the commission of the acts defined and penalized under section 4, 5 to 12. Okay, uh, remember that uh, ATC is not a uh, judicial or, or even a quasi-judicial body. It is chaired by the executive uh, secretary, then co-chaired now by uh, the NICA, among others, okay, and, and the executive. So the assets or said individual groups or association may be subject to freezing by the AMLA for 20 days. Next slide. The designation is done, as I said, by the ATC, not a judicial, not even a quasi judicial agency. And we have experienced, uh, uh, received uh, complaints on red tagging, labeling, branding of individuals and organizations of lefties, communists, and terrorists has been used to silence dissent. This constitutes grave threat to life, liberty, and security of individuals and families. Red tagging and labeling delegitimizes dissent cause public stigma and invites anyone to commit further atrocities against the person tag. Okay, next slide. Okay, now on the prescription. This is a, a, a judicial declaration for, uh, for terrorists. Okay, and this is done upon the application of the Department of Justice before the authorizing division of the Court of Appeals. We do notice an opportunity to be heard given to the group of persons, organizations, or association. Well, uh, it, it's good that, that it's the Court of Appeals that do the prescription, but there is uh, a, uh, a red, a red, there's a warning, uh, we are quite warned here. The application shall be filed with urgent prayer for the issuance of preliminary order of prescription. No application for prescription shall be filed with, without the authority of the ATC upon recommendation of the National uh, Intelligence Coordinate, Coordinating Agency. So there is not yet uh, a, uh, a uh, judicial determination of uh, uh, whether or not a group of an individual is a terrorist, but that person is already preliminary, uh, preliminary uh, proscribed. Okay, next slide, please. Where the court has determined uh, this one, probable cause exists on the basis of verified application, which is sufficient, it will issue a preliminary order within 72 hours, prescription, uh, order of prescription declaring the respondent as a terrorist and an outlawed organization or association within the meaning of section 26 of this act. It violates the right to free association. And it also constitutes a violation of the prohibition of bill of attainder, which gives no opportunity to, to the person to challenge the prescription. Next slide. Now, this is, this is also very alarming under the anti-terrorism bill. The provision of Article 125, the revised penal code, to the contrary notwithstanding, uh, any law enforcement agent or military personnel who have been duly authorized in writing by the ATC has taken custody of a person suspected of committing only of the acts of, of terrorism and the other, other crimes shall without incurring any criminal liability for the delay of detained person. So under this provision, a suspect terrorist can be detained 
for a period of 14 days and can be extended still to a maximum period of 10 calendar days. Okay, next slide, please. And this is, this is not in consonance with the Constitution and with our laws. Under ordinary circumstances, you can only detain an individual, a suspect, uh, without judicial warrant for a period of, uh, it depends upon the crime, 12, 24, or 36, or a maximum of one, one and a half days. Under extraordinary circumstances, such as in rebellion, invasion, and to suppress lawless violence, the maximum that the, that the Constitution provides is three days. So warrantless arrest under SA is also three days. But also, this is, is more in consonance with the Constitution, which, provide, which provides that when the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, uh, a person can be detained uh, for a period of three days without a judicial warrant and a, a maximum of three days before the filing of the appropriate uh, case in court. Under the international standard, delay in bringing to court must not exceed 48 hours. Uh, under, uh, and if it exceeds 48 hours, there must be an exceptional circumstances that, that should be uh, provided for, that should be provided. Now, the ATC here, which is not a quasi-judicial agency, has tremendous powers that will derogate on civil liberties. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, these are just the deleted safeguards that we found helpful, Sana, uh, on, on anti-terrorism. Number one would be the right to challenge the surveillance. There should be an opportunity under Section uh, 9 of HSA, uh, which is deleted on the, on the ATB, is to challenge, if he or she intends to do so, the legality of the infer interference before the Court of Appeals, which is issued, which issued the written order. Number two, next slide, please. Uh, uh, also, the penalty for failure to deliver the suspect uh, was uh, deleted. Okay, next slide, please. And the damages, which is uh, uh, would really be uh, a safeguard, was not. Uh, was also deleted. Uh, of course, they argue that this is really very, very big uh, penalty because 500,000 uh, for every day uh, that the person is arrested when, when he's proven to be not a terrorist. But there should at least be a, uh, uh, an amount that should be given under the law. Uh, but uh, according to proponents, uh, we will follow, just follow the ordinary uh, rules on damages, moral, uh, exemplary, among others. Next slide, please. Uh, damages for frozen property, also 500,000. Next slide, deleted. Removal of the prosecutory powers of the CHR. Well, they argue that the CHR under the Constitution has no prosecutory powers, but that has not been questioned under the HSA. And uh, it might also be a deterrent to abuse of uh, the anti-terror law. Next slide, please. And down to my last two slides. The grievance committee also, if there is a complaint against uh, an imp um, implementer or police law enforcement officials, they can have, uh, they can file the complaint uh, with, the, with the grievance committee. But that under the ATB anti-terror bill has already been uh, uh, deleted. Number seven. Uh, I think I'm my, on my last slide. Suspension of law one month before and two months after any election. We have a history, quite a, a colorful history in elections. And this might be used no, by uh, any sitting uh, political figure against an opponent in the elections. So uh, we feel that it should have been retained under the anti-terror bill law. I think that's, uh, I, I, I'm already on my slide. Okay, next slide. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I hope I have imparted something on uh, the uh, uh, anti-terror bill from a human rights perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney Erwin Kaliba from the Commission on Human Rights. Again, if you have insights and comments, you can share them through the chat. Uh, for Zoom, or you can send, send the questions via Slido. The event code is ATLS2020. We, uh, as mentioned, we are going to reserve all of the questions and the insights later in our Q&A section. 
And so we proceed to with our next speaker. Again, thank you very much, uh, Attorney Kaliba. Our next speaker was our first guest in the um, uh, anti-terror lecture series. And he is also a household name uh, because of his expertise. A Filipino academic with international security, as an international security analyst, and a political science scholar, a chairman, the chairman of the board of the Philippine Institute for Peace, Violence, and Terrorism Research, and is the director of the Center for Intelligence and National Security Studies. He finished his BA and MA in political science at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, and he took his PhD in political science um, from the same school. He got his PhD in international relations at the Jinan University in Guangzhou, China. And um, he is currently a professor of political science and international relations at the National Defense College of the Philippines. He's also assistant professor of international studies at the De La Salle University and instructor for uh, political science at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. Uh, among, there, there are so many uh, items here in a CV, and we will just share them with you. But uh, he is a household name, especially for those of you who are following all these discussions on terrorism, peace, and violence. But the last part that I'd like to share in the terms of his uh, credentials, he has authored several books, and I will mention some of them. The Marawi Siege and its Aftermath, The Continuing Terrorist Threats, uh, The Al-Harakatul al Islamia. Essays on the Abu Sayyaf Group, Terrorism in the Philippines from Al-Qaeda to ISIS, Marawi City Siege and Threats of Narco-Terrorism in the Philippines, The Philippine Security in the Age of Terror, Counter-Terrorism Measures in Southeast Asia, How Effective Are They, War on Terrorism in Southeast Asia, and the Maritime Terrorism in Southeast Asia, the Abu Sayyaf Threat. Friends, please welcome our returning speaker, Professor Romel Banlawi. Thank you very much, uh, Wally, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Attorney Kaliba, for your very insightful uh, presentation. I think what you have said are, in fact, very essential for us to address the uh, human rights uh, concerns associated with the anti-terrorism law. So I will design my presentation based on your uh, uh, concerns. Uh, so, and uh, I'll be doing this from the perspective not of a lawyer, but from a political science scholar engaged in counter-terrorism research, and also a political science scholar having uh, studied the international humanitarian law and international human rights. So let me address uh, one by one all the human rights concerns uh, raised by uh, Attorney uh, Erin. First, on the broadening of the definition of terrorism. Uh, there is a necessity to really broaden the definition of terrorism in order to address the current nature of terrorist threats that we uh, face today. In the Human Security Act of 2007, you have to commit actual acts of terrorism before you can be charged of terrorism offenses. But under the anti-terrorism law of uh, 2020, we, we, law enforcement authorities will not wait for actual commission of acts of terrorism to happen. Uh, the main intention of the anti-terrorism anti law is to focus heavily on prevention, in order to uh, avoid actual acts of terrorism to occur. And what are these prevention? Uh, prevention will happen from, uh, from uh, prior activities, prior to the commission of the acts of terrorism. Uh, what, what are these? Recruitment, financing, training, inciting, and even cuddling terrorists will be prosecuted under anti-terrorism uh, law. The main reason for this is to prevent individuals or organization to actually commit acts of uh, terrorism. The purpose here is uh, prevention. Because we have seen in the past people with intention to commit acts of terrorism but cannot be uh, prosecuted. But under this law, by mere planning, by mere financing, by mere training, uh, and by mere supporting, even inciting, people to commit acts of terrorism will be liable under uh, the law. Now, the question raised by Attorney Erwin, why are you penalizing uh, people only thinking about committing a crime? Because crime has not been committed yet. Under the anti-terrorism law, there is an assumption that prior to that intention, there are already existing acts prior to that intention. For example, 
if you intend to bomb Malacanang, uh, that intention can be liable under anti-terrorism law because there are prior acts prior to that intention. You bought materials for improvised explosive device, you conducted training for bomb making, or you solicited money for the financing of the terrorist acts, or you incite people to become violent. So those are the acts prior to the commission of actual acts that are intended to be prosecuted under the anti-terrorism law. Okay, so that's one. Uh, regarding uh, wide, allowing wide discretion of law enforcement, uh, no, no, the law enforcement will not be given uh, wide discretion here, but will be given greater power and authority to act quickly on terrorist threats. And this power cannot be exercised arbitrarily. It has to be authorized by the Anti-Terrorism Council. No arrest, no, surveil no surveillance will be conducted by law enforcement without prior approval of the Anti-Terrorism Council. And the Anti-Terrorism Council will not also approve any surveillance or any uh, warranted arrest without information com coming from the National Intelligence Coordinating Agency serving as the Secretariat of the Anti-Terrorism Council. So uh, th there is a process now. If you uh, conduct uh, warrantless arrest, there's also a human rights safeguard there that if you intend to conduct warrant, uh, warrant of arrest associated with terrorism cases, you have to immediately inform the nearest court nearest court and also notify the Commission of Human Rights okay, and also notify the Anti-Terrorism Council. So those are safeguards to protect the rights of the suspect. And if suspects are arrested uh, without warrant and uh, becomes liable to the anti-terrorism law, uh, he will be read with all his uh, rights like the Miranda Doctrine and even the right to have uh, counsel. And uh, if law enforcement uh, authorities are found violating all these rights of the suspect, then there will be concomitant punishment for uh, illegal arrest or illegal surveillance, uh, the, the 10, 000, uh, 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 up to 10 years of uh, imprisonment. So that's the intention of the law. In fact, if you will read the declaration of the policy of the anti-terrorism law, the main reason on why this law is enacted is precisely to protect the life, liberty, and property of the Filipino people against terrorist act and not to curtail the, the, the right, liberty, and property of the Filipino people. This law is against terrorism. This law is not against the Filipino people. So uh, if there are fears about uh, this law being used for uh, abuse, there are checks, uh, checks for abuse. Uh, the anti-terrorism law created the Joint Oversight Committee uh, composed of the members of the Philippine Senate and the Philippine Congress. And as you have said, the Attorney Erwin, even the Commission of Human Rights has a special provision uh, for this in order to uh, investigate any violations of uh, human rights associated with the implementation of this law. In fact, in the Declaration of Policy in the Anti-Terrorism Law, it states there that the protection of human rights is absolute at all times. So at all times, meaning 24-7, walang hintuto. So uh, if there are, if there are uh, human rights violations associated with the enforcement of this law, we still have a lot of existing laws that can, uh, can prosecute uh, law enforcement for uh, any uh, unlawful uh, use of uh, this law. Now regarding the, the issue of surveillance, uh, we're tapping. Uh, this is a practice uh, not only in developing countries, but even in mature democracies. This is being practiced in uh, France, Germany, and Australia. In, in fact, we pattern this after uh, Australia. And compared to Australia, our law is in fact very, very conservative. Australia has what we call hyper-legislation on uh, anti-terrorism. Uh, so uh, the use of our tapping uh, operation is in fact lawful. Uh, it has to be uh, approved by the Court of Appeals. And if there is unlawful, unlawful use of uh, wiretapping operation, then uh, there are concomitant punishment for this uh, unlawful use. Now, uh, regarding uh, red tacking and branding and labeling, uh, it will not be used for, for red tagging. However, if you're advocating violence, if you're advocating terrorism, if you're advocating uh, terror, then you will be answerable under this law. However, if you want to undergo mass protest, 
and the demonstration, so you're protected uh, because under the anti-terrorism law, all your civil and political rights will be uh, protected. So for me, there's nothing to fear about. Now, Attorney Erwin enumerated some other details about the uh, possibility of uh, abuse during a prosecution. Now, uh, if there are some procedural issues pertaining to that, then I think uh, you have to address that in the implementing rules and regulation. But we have to take into account that the main intention of this law is not to be used against human rights violations, but in fact, to uphold the rights of the Filipino people, particularly the rights to life, liberty, and property, which shall be protected by the state at all times, in absolute at all times. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Banlawi. So we've heard from our guest from the Commission on Human Rights. We've heard from Professor Banlawi from the academic and research sector. This time around, we are going to listen to perspective from the private security sector. And our next speaker is an ASIS International Certified Protection Professional, also a certified campus security manager, and um, also a, an international crime prevention specialist. He is one of the very few certified anti-terrorism specialists in the Philippines. He is also a certified electronic access control and, uh, and certified in internet protocol camera. He is the president and managing director of Asian Associates Risk Management, the top technical security design consultant of several large real estate companies, and currently the CEO of Arslan SRS Philippines. Um, our guest, next speaker is the International Crime Prevention Specialist, and he has received certification in business security management from Chartered International Institute of Security and Crisis Management and the first certified lodging security officer and supervisor in the Philippines. He's also gold level certified guest service practitioner of the American Hotels and Lodging Education Institute. He has completed courses from the McAfee Institute on digital and mobile forensics, investigative interviewing methodologies and advanced social media intelligence gathering. He attended the executive course in national security from the National Defense College of the Philippines and has earned a master's in management degree from the Asian Institute of Management, where he is currently taking up the executive master in disaster risk and crisis management. He is also the current assistant regional vice president for Region 33 Philippines of the ASIS International and the past chair of ASIS Philippines chapter, a member of the ASIS Pacific Advisory Council of ASIS International. Again mentioned, he's, uh, he holds a master's degree in management from the Asian Institute of Management, and he belongs to the Makatao class of 1989 of the Philippine Military Academy. He finished his computer science and programming education from the University of Negros Occidental de Coletos, where he also studied electrical engineering. He finished a course in marketing planning in the hospitality industry, boutique hotels from Cornell University in 2006. Friends, please welcome our next speaker, Augustus Cesar, Cesar Esmeralda, or Ace. Sir Ace, good morning. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ali, for that very long introduction. Uh, I think I have edited it, but I think uh, you really get uh, carried over. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm so honored to be speaking in front of distinguished uh, colleagues and those uh, friends from different sectors. I know that this group that we are now increasing in numbers is representative of different uh, private sectors. But right now here, I am just a private citizen. I may speak on the, the sentiments of the private sector. Um, why could you bring up my slides, please? Next slide, Bye. Uh, my portion today is on the private and corporate uh, security perspective on the anti-terrorism bill. Because for us in the private sector, we believe that, next slide please, the definition itself of terrorism is the main contention because everything starts on the definition of uh, terrorism. When we took up our terrorism courses, we know that there are several meanings of terrorism. But now, if this bill is passed, then everybody will really practically be glued into that definition. So, 
once we have the definition of terrorism, the corporate security management definition will have to change. It has to be pegged into what the Philippines is defining it. This will have implications because a lot of the corporates in the Philippines, corporate security uh, organization in the Philippines, and those who are in multinational companies with global uh, presence, they really have to stick also to the definition of terrorism in the Philippines. So there's a need for my colleagues and everyone, to my clients also, that we have to modify the policies and procedures on how we respond to uh, anti and counter terrorism. So another thing that we say realized in the bill itself was that were there representation from the fiber sector? Was it only the academe? But because I heard that uh, Professor Banlawi was uh, approached and also from the, the, the lawyers of UP School of, of Law, College of Law. And are there also consultation among the constituents of the lawmakers? If I just read and follow the, the sides of the government, I get a bit confused because they're saying that it is against uh, the NPAs in Caraga, for example or they are against the Muslim rebels or the terrorists in uh, ARMM. No? So this is really a shift because I've been assigned, I've been in combat in, uh, against the NPA, against the Muslim rebels, but there are to be safety or uh, mechanism that we cannot just la label everyone as a terrorist just because of uh, a mere suspicion that they are planning. You know? Because if we take into the consideration that uh, a mere planning is already uh, constitute the crime, then we might also think how, how we uh, arrest or apprehend those who are planning for kidnapping. You know? Because uh, planning is in the mind and how do we really read the mind? Another concern is that why do we have a concern on private security? First, the private security force, or they call the security guards, the, the security professionals, our number is more than those who are in the uniform service combined. No? And we have more nationwide presence and spread than any organization of the government. No? And most of the people now in the corporate sector, most of them are attending here, those are not in service. We came from the military and police and law enforcement, but we know that private and corporate security management is uh, different from what we've learned from the service. Next slide, please. So the implication here of the anti-terrorism bill in our side in the private security sector goes beyond gun bombs and guns. No? So there are always assurance that, uh, that there are safety nets in the bill that this is not the intention of the bill as uh, emphasized by uh, Professor Banawi, but this is the natural process. Every bill that we pass in Congress, we always have these nice assurances that there are safeguards. And then there, the intention is this and that. But then the question is, is this deep service? No? What is that to us? Is this, a, this is a typical thing that we do for every uh, law that we pass. It's not perfect. But at least we strive that there are not so much loopholes that even us in the private sectors who are not already in the government will have our own protection. So it, it goes beyond bombs and guns. No? We, we see that the government approach on counterterrorism is not just fighting the, the hearts and minds of the people, rooting out the, the root cause or addressing the narratives of the people in the in the countrysides, no? but practically more of a high-tech solution like, say, the soldiers, the policemen have all these guns and bullets. No? They have all this uh, equipment in their body. They are uniform. But if you look at it, how do we define ter terrorism in the private sector? If you look at the slide, there's that behind mass. No? This is what we use in ACE and associates. It's multiple active shooting and killing. Because if we just follow the Western uh, way of dealing with active shooting, then usually they, they can define it whether it's terrorism or not. But how do we define it in the Philippines? Is active shooting a terrorism immediately? 
or we can put any connotation into that and then we model the, the real issues on saying it's terrorism. Why this is very important for us in the private sector is because there are different ways of protecting corporate assets that are spread in the entire Philippines against terrorism or plain uh, security breaches. No? So we always look behind political motives on any of the security incidents that are affecting uh, business disruptions. So there's another thing that concerns me is that there seems to be no discussion on cyber terrorism uh, in this uh, uh, ATB, you know, Anti-Terrorism Bureau. In this world now, especially in the private and large corporations, we are so exposed. We, our data, our assets, our operations are all connected to the cyber. You know? it's now, we are now in the internet of things. And we should have really dwell on this also because if we don't address cyber terrorism, but then the government and the law enforcers will use cyber, uh, cyber uh, mechanism against uh, the supposedly, let's say, suspects, then there will be a muddling of issues also. And then another thing that we have to consider also that in this age of terrorism, most of the casualties are in the private sectors. They are the public, the innocent, and they become the collaterals. People in the churches, uh, in, the, in the church, people in the, in the schools, in the marketplace, they are really the ones that are being targeted for bombs, uh, multiple killings. But what if they are targeted against the combatants? Can we say that the encounter between the Philippine Army and the NPAs, the Philippine Army or the Philippine Marines against the, the Abu Sayyaf, are they still terrorism or they are acts of war? So th this has to be connected because for an ordinary citizen or for a private individual, the fighting there of uh, the Abu Sayyaf cannot be the, the same uh, landscape and uh, uh, perception when you are already in the corporate world. But terrorism can still be in a form of insider threats inside a company. Now, the last thing I think that is really that concerns the private sector is the disruption to economic uh, activity. The moment that we, the moment that the government will say, responsibly say that there is terrorism in one area and it's not yet proven, a mere statement on terrorism or capturing one terrorism terrorists in one tourism area is enough already to stop the activity there. And we know that uh, the, the, the impact to, to tourism, the number two disruptor with a long recovery period is terrorism. And also such will affect also foreign investments. So I think, uh, next slide, I think that I have uh, raised some issues already and uh, I'm really expecting that my colleagues uh, from the private sector, we also ask questions and uh, we can uh, discuss on those things. So again, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. We now can pass on to Wally. Okay, thank you, Sir Ace. Our last speaker is um, somebody that I think most of you are already familiar with, just like the rest of our earlier speakers. I'm going to read through his very impressive CV. Um, he is a pub product of the public school a graduated class valedictorian in 1984 at the Bully Bully Elementary School and the class salutatorian in 1988 at the Sumisip National High School. Having spent his elementary and secondary education in Basilan, he ventured to Manila at the age of 16 to pursue college. He enrolled in the Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering at the AMA Computer University in Manila. In 2000, he was named top nominee of AMIN, Anak Mindanao, party list that was then seeking a seat at the House of Representatives. He graduated from the House of Representatives after having served for uh, three terms as uh, congressman in the 12th to 14th Congress. He has sponsored and authored 14 House bills, the most significant of which are the following. The H House Bill number 03012, an act prohibiting discrimination against persons on account of ethnic origin and or religious belief, which was approved on third readings by both House of Congress. He also co-authored 69 House bills to include, um, include, among others, the Carper Law and the Generics Medicine Act. Following the ARMM synchronization law, 
President Benigno S. Aquino III appointed him to a bigger responsibility in December of 2011 to become the OIC Governor of the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Uh, believing in education as the most potent tool for change, our speaker took priority to address the state of literacy in education at the ARM, ARMM. While doing so, he took personal attention to delve into the plight of school teachers, the state of affairs in the region's education department, and the persistent irregularities he found uh, while doing his uh, services in the area. He also found the niche for his massive reform agenda at the education sector. Our speaker now has a fresh mandate to continue institution, instituting reforms at the IRMM, where he won as regional governor in 2013 midterm election. Under his leadership, novel programs like the ARMM Helps, Health, Education, Livelihood, Peace and Security and Synergy, and ARMM Heart, Humanitarian Emergency Action Response Team are now being implemented across the five provinces of ARMM. ARMM helps to seek maximize efforts of the agencies by converging through a community-driven device in far-flung barangays which have either not received any intervention programs or have very little access to basic services, whether by the government or non-government organizations. And ARMR, ARMM Heart aims to provide a quick response Two emergency situations. Friends, please, a uh, virtual round of applause for our last speaker, Congressman Mujib Hataman of the House of Representatives. Congressman, welcome. Hi, welcome. Uh, magandang umaga. Good morning, no, don sa mga resource persons and to all the viewers. Um, paano, ko ba sab paano ba magsimula? First, let me begin by saying na. Every, I, I think we are all in agreement, even in the legislators, that we have to end terrorism in our country and of the world. No? Second, uh, kung meron siguro dapat mag-yes sa anti-terror law, ako na yon. Kung halimbawa nakita ko sana, ito yung paraan or solution lang to address terrorism. Pero hindi nga ganon kadali. At uh, based on our experience uh, sa Muslim communities and a guy from Basilan, we have a different approach and we have a different uh, uh, methods in addressing terrorism. Um, una, you may ask, bakit ho ako na nag-say no to ATB? No? Ang pag-say no ko to anti sa Human Security Act of 2020, it doesn't mean that I am a sympathizer or in favor of terrorism. Kundi, uh, naghahanap ho ako ng mas malinaw. One, hindi vague ang definition. Second, hindi ma-infringe yung karapatan ng bawat isa. Join ho, Joe. Hello? Hello? Naririnig ako? Hello? Yo. Yes, sir. Go ahead po. Uh, so, yun yung mga dahilan. And, um, Siguro magbibig lang ho ako ng experience dito sa amin. And um, actually kung tutuusin ho um, ang Abu Sayyaf dito na ipundar, ang Abu Sayyaf dito nag-operate. In fact, ito yung malaking contributory factor kung bakit mataas yung poverty incidence dito sa amin. On the other hand, even with or without Human Security Act, we were able to address or to lessen the threat of terrorism in the province of Bastilan compared to other provinces. Not because of any enforcement uh, policies, but because of the collaborative efforts of the local government units, the security sector, and uh, and other uh, the religious sector and other stakeholders. Kaya yun yung argument nga ho, uh, pagdating sa Kongreso na tinatanong namin, etong panukalang batas natin, for example, yung Human Security Act of 2020 or even Human Security Security Act of 2007. This is more on law enforcement. And believe me, hindi ho makukuha lang sa law enforcement ang pag-end ng terrorism. Kailangan ng isang comprehensive program. Kailangan ng comprehensive policies. Let me uh, give you an example. In 2014, when we launched the program against violent extremism in the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, and we piloted the province of Basilan as the pilot area, we were successfully uh, convinced 
uh, more than 200 Abu Sayyaf or terrorist individual to join the mainstream community. Out of the 214 we interviewed, only 7% of them who say that they joined Abu Sayyaf because of ideology. Most of them, they joined because of insecurity, because of injustices, because of uh, uh, unemployment, because they, there is no livelihood, because there is no education. So, tingin ko, ito yung kulang dito sa House, sa Human Security Act of 2020. So, yun nga ang minumungkahi natin sana kung inopen to for more interpolation, kung sana nag-invite tayo ng mga experts based sa mga experience. Ang sinasabi ho ng mga author, sabi nila, in fact, naririnig ko rin kay Prof. Banloy, I do agree doon sa nakita ng taga-CHR, nakita ni Prof. Banloy, na ito yung intent. I do agree with the intent. Pero remember, in 2001 or 2002, ng state of lawlessness sa Basilan, hindi ho pinahina ng state of lawlessness ang terrorism sa Basilan. Lalong pinalakas nila dahil malawak yung pang-aabuso. At merong mga individual na nahuhuli na hindi kabilang sa terrorist individual or organization. Magbigay ho ako ng alimbawa. Merong isang mag-anak. No? Ang isa ay CAFGO. Ang isa ay ordinary citizen ng barangay. Dumaan sa isang checkpoint. Alam niyo ho, namatay na lang sa kulungan ang CAFGO bago sabihin ng korte na wala siyang kasalanan. At totoo naman, kasi kahit ako ho, personally kilala ko yung mga... Ito yung fear natin uh, dito sa panukalang batas na Human Security Act of 2000, uh, 2020. Ang daming mga provision no, na lalong pinalakas at ang daming mga provision na lalong pinahina yung protection ng karapatan or yung protection sa ating mga kababayan. Remember ho, um, even kayo ho, no, even si Prof. Banloy alam niya na alam ko na expert sa dito pagdating sa security and issues ng terrorism. Pero ga gaano tayo kasigurado na lahat ng nahuhuli natin ay terorista? At hindi natin sila bibigyan ng protection. Hindi kaya ang implication ng... Uh, Pagtanggal sa Section 15 ng Human Security Act of uh, 2007 ay lalong magbibigay ng kapangyarihan sa law enforcer at gamitin at maging mapangabuso dahil pwedeng aristuhin ang kanino man dahil wala na ang deterrent at protection doon sa mga naarestong pagkakamali. So ito ho yung dahilan bakit maraming uh, mga kababayan nating Muslim na nahuli at nailalabas din dahil wala hong matibay na kaso at pundasyon. Kung tutuusin ho, dito sa Human Security Act of 2020, binigyan ng kapangyarihan tayong mag-surveillance. Wala tayong dapat ipangamba para tanggalin pa yung Section 50 na nagbibigay ng protection sa ating mga kababayan. So, and mainly ho, ang recommendation ko sana rito sa ating lahat at uh, sa ibang policy maker din natin, Gagawa tayo, ayusin natin to, bumuo tayo ng isang comprehensive na panukalang batas na andyan yung malinaw na programa na sumasakop sa politika, sum na halimbawa katulad nung pamamahala sa local government, sumasakop sa injustices, sumasakop sa social services, bigyan ng tamang hanap buhay ang ating mga kababayan at ma-encourage natin sila bumalik. Sa totoo lang, habang gumagawa tayong batas na potential na maabuso lang law enforcers, lalong magbibigay ito ng narrative at magbibigay ng rason at mapapalakas lalo natin ang kalaban ng ating gobyerno. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Congressman Hataman. Now we're opening up the floor for questions and answers. So we would like to ask uh, Professor Banlawi, Attorney Kaliba, uh, Congressman Hataman, and Sir Ace Esmeralda to turn on their video so that we can hear and see them answer the questions. I'm going to read out loud first the ones posted uh, on Slido. This one is uh, directed to Attorney Kaliba. Aren't other laws promoting HR, including the Constitution, considered safeguards to this law? Uh, yes, uh, the Constitution, uh, especially in Article 3, uh, states the Bill of Rights. But uh, the law, uh, as it is stated right now, has the tendency or in a tendency to really violate civil and political rights that's guaranteed under the 1987 Constitution. That's why 
uh, we are saying uh, remove those provisions that are not really necessary. In the HSA, it doesn't punish planning. It doesn't punish uh, those other 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 punishment. It's only uh, conspiracy and uh, accessories. Why are we putting so much uh, emphasis on preparation? I understand really coming from, but we have to put safeguards. That's why we're saying uh, in the safety measure under Section 4, that says that it does not, that the exercise of civil and political rights is not terrorism without the qualification or the exception to the exception. Okay. Thank you, uh, Attorney. This one is directed towards uh, Professor Banlawi. I understand that there are safeguards for unwarranted arrests, such as those you mentioned. However, why are they not indicated in the AT law? Professor Banlawi? I think... Uh, okay. I think he uh, dropped off uh, for a minute there. So we'll park that question. There's another one from... Um, uh, directed to him. I'll read, I'll read that later on. Friends, those of you who would like to ask questions, you can raise your hand so we can uh, um, arrange those who would like to share uh, in the proper order where when we see your hands being raised. There are also several insights and comments in the chat room. I am going to read them in the interest of time. Um, this one is from Sir Owen Dakayan. There is always danger in the interpretation, no matter what bill it may be. For example, the IATF COVID protocols with different interpretations and implementations on the ground. Okay, uh, let's go to somebody raising his hand. Sir Ricardo uh, Blancaflor. You can, the floor is yours. You can raise your questions, sir, or insights. More like insights. Thank you very much. No, number one, who are the people criticizing this anti-terror bill? Uh, most of them are the same ones who criticize the Human Security Act. The ones who criticize the cybersecurity or the national uh, uh, ID system. In other words, they were criticizing it for their own personal or maybe political agenda. Isn't it about time we ask the victims of terrorism their, own, their viewpoints? Ask the people who were killed, the women who were raped, both women, young boys who were raped, soldiers, police who were beheaded. Ask their opinion also. The, the other point is, like I said, I'm not asking a question, it's an insight. If I were to raise uh, questions, I, I could fill up the entire lecture because I, I was very much involved in the agency. Um, you know, in terrorism, the paradigm is the weakness of the strong and the strength of the weak. The terrorists, there are few of them. They're just led by their ideology. If they became terrorists because of economic matters and they remain terrorists because of ideology, then they're there because of the ideology. They have practically uh, no organization, less money. So in a sense, they are weak. But because they are not handcuffed by any law, they're not handcuffed by any constitution, they're actually strong. The law enforcement, the police, the correctional officers, the military, they have organization, they have budget, they have arms, they have equipment. Yet they're weak because they have to follow the constitution. They have to follow what's what's in the law. I am challenging anyone in the anti-terror bill. There are more provisions safeguarding the citizen and against the interests of the law enforcers. The law enforcers here, I have not known any law that has so much um, prohibitions, so much warnings, so much threat against the law enforcers. And I will end with this. For the terrorists to decide to, to win, to be successful, you only need one bomb to go. For the uh, frontliners in the fight against terrorism, they have to be successful 24 hours a day. For the terrorists, it takes only one bomb to be successful. I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
Okay, for our for those watching, you can uh, key in your questions and insights into the chat box uh, for Zoom. Uh, I, I hope that our speakers are also monitoring the questions. I'm going to read those that are in the slide though. This one is again directed towards Attorney Kaliba. What if I did not do the bombing but funded it and was part of the planning only? Shouldn't I be liable for terrorism? Uh, that's already supporting. I, I think th there's a, uh, a, a provision uh, really penalizing, uh, supporting uh, under, under in the HSA and under the ATB. Okay. Again, friends, if you would like to share your insights or ask questions directly, please do raise your hand. We can monitor from uh, the participants, those who would like to uh, be the one to direct the questions to our speakers. Also, our speakers are free to um, share uh, answers, uh, even if the questions were not directed to you. Okay. Um, this one, I think, um, there's a question from Sir Alex Pama. Sir Alex, if you can uh, share your questions to the group. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We loud and clear. Okay, uh, j just two points. Um, the first one is, uh, with all due respect to uh, Attorney Rick Bancaflor, I think uh, uh, it's also not fair to say that anybody and everybody who is now in, uh, in the debate about um, objections to the anti-terror bill will be lumped up into uh, somebody who has an agenda uh, against uh, the government or against the law in itself. The bill, uh, in fairness, has a lot of, of good points, as well as very, as well as some points that I think we need to debate a lot uh, further. And and which brings me to the point uh, of um, Congressman Hataman earlier, wherein he said that um, draconian. Uh, he did not say this, but from my point of view, a draconian law may not necessarily be a um, uh, the the solution to uh, quelling uh, terrorism. And, and that brings me to, to wonder why in the legislative process, as I stated in the, the chat box, why was it practically railroaded, if you may call it that, in Congress, when uh, that should have been where the debate about these things uh, should be undertaken. Um, in Basilan, indeed, as what uh, Congressman Ataman said, um, when we were there, it was not just exactly uh, purely uh, the, 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 right, uh, the right hand or the, the force of law that was uh, being than, but the other, the soft power of government that can be undertaken as, uh, to move against terrorism. So the question that I would pose basically is to Congressman Ataman, why the process was not done and why not much debate has been undertaken uh, for this uh, very, very important bill. Thank you. Hey, Alex. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think in in the Senate, no, yes, in the Senate there was a process of uh, debate because it was in February when they approved the proposed measure. But in Congress, that's why we raised some questions, even in the committee level. We conducted four hearings, but in the fifth hearing, because we are about to adjourn, the leadership of the House, especially the committee chair. Uh, proposed that the bill approved by the Senate be uh, adapted by the lower house purposely to fast track the approval of the uh, of the proposed measure. I don't want to say that it was railroaded, but it's up to you to judge it. But actually, uh, many um, Congress persons who wanted to interpolate during the plenary session, but they were not allowed accordingly uh, because of the time constraint. But with this kind, I think with this kind of uh, measure, I think we need to hear some experts. In fact, during the committee hearing, I even suggested to the committee chair to invite, uh, because terrorism is a question of ideology, I think we have to invite Muslim experts. How... Uh, what are the ideologies of Muslim terrorists, if ever? But 
uh, they did not. Uh, it was not happened. And uh, as I've said, the committee, uh, um, the committee chair uh, adopted and the, commit, the entire committee adopted the version of the Senate purposely to adopt it on that day. So I think on the issue of railroading, uh, as I've said, there are congresspersons who wanted to interpolate, but they, they, they did not uh, give in time. And, uh, sir, sir, can I, I, I just want to say uh, one point no, in relation to the point raised by uh, Rick Blancaflor on the issue of uh, to lump up that those who are against that, uh, wh what are the reasons? We have reasons. I am not against any, uh, the passage of terror law. We have to. But the question is what type of one kind, what kind of human security act? Remember, we are legislator and we are mandated to enact law that protect every, every person. We are not, ex let us not uh, make an excuse that because of the terrorism threat that we have to pass a law at the expense of individual uh, rights. So actually that's the, and I would like to inform uh, Yusek Blanca Flor I am for ID system, but I am against, I am against the anti-terrorism law, purposely because of the abuses that we have witnessed in the province of Basilan during the state of lawlessness uh, in 2001 and 2002. Thank you, Congressman. This one is from Magila Salvacion. In relation to the past experiences and observation of infringement of freedom of speech in relation to Human Security Act and other laws related to anti-terrorism, may I know if there is a statistics on this and on these cases, what happened to the violations? Were there cases filed? And what was the result of the case? If there was a result in the case, was this brought to the legislature for amendments of the law or an argument to the raising, to the passing of this bill? I think that the question was directed to me, Wally. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm not really sure if we have, but I think uh, the, the, uh, uh, the violation of uh, freedom of speech is not punished under, under the, the old law. That's why we're, we're raising this concern uh, in uh, the inciting, uh, what does any speech for whatsoever may be, may be, uh, interpreted to be inciting to uh, commit terrorism, uh, among others, that, that can be used by law enforcers. We're, we're, not, we're not really, uh, uh, what, what we're really saying is put sufficient safeguards such that these basic fundamental freedoms are respected. Remember that the state through the government is a pow is powerful. The immense powers are given to the government. What we as ordinary citizens have have only the rights that we can invoke uh, in times where we feel that our rights are being violated. Okay, thank you, Attorney. This one I'm going to read from Sir Hermi Colina, and I think some of you have, have read this as well. Uh, according, this is to your presentation, Attorney. Very lawyer-centric and expected from somebody from CHR. Indeed, all laws have diverse interpretations being crafted by lawyers themselves. Uh, his comments are misplaced. Besides, we have courts to provide judicial determination of the offense committed. For example, the fraudulent recruitment, the court would have de to determine whether the recruitment was indeed fraudulent based on evidence presented. So he's saying just file a case before the Supreme Court to seek final determination as to whether this law is constitutional or not. Your comment, sir. Yeah, that's why we're, that's why we're talking in, in policy making and in uh, and in law making. Uh, we really have to hear uh, each other's side. Uh, his question was: uh, It can be subject to all laws can be subject to interpretation. Exactly the principle that we are uh, that even UN is advocating the principle of the principle of uh, legality uh, under Article 15 of the ICCPR. All criminal acts should be precisely defined such that there will be little or no room for interpretation. That's what we're, we're, we're asking. And if ever it cannot be put that way in a very clear and precise manner, at least safeguards are put in place under the law. Okay. 
Thank you for that. There are several questions directed at Professor Banlawi, but Professor Banlawi will be back to our uh, webinar in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to read through some of the questions that are addressed to anybody. This one is from uh, arzaniel at yahoo.com. How can anyone miss it? Killing an active political candidate is a terror act. There is a clear political intent to influence the democratic process direct government to react or make it a hostage to a certain electoral result, the mo and most especially instill terror to voters or greater public, including non-voters, that is. Maybe. Okay, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's an insight that uh, I think for all of us to also think about. Uh, this one is... Uh, um, from Leo Crescente Ferrer, how can we prevent the ATC from being used as an attack dog of the regime against its perceived terrorists? There is a broad definition of terrorism in the proposed ATD. Attorney, uh, do you have some insights okay. to that? Uh, that's why uh, the ATC is composed of the executive branch. Uh, uh, those that are, are really given to the judicial uh, branch should be performed. Uh, example for, for the designation, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the preliminary prescription, this calls for judicial determination. It's not just the ATC. Uh, secondly, uh, there should be independence. Uh, the, D, the DOJ is, is a member of uh, the uh, ATC, but the DOJ has the National Prosecution Service. They are the ones that prosecute it. Now, if a case is filed, uh, an information is filed with, with the prosecution office, and there's already a pronouncement coming from the ATC, will, will, will a prosecutor go against his boss? Or if uh, the prosecutor will go against his boss, will, will, will DOJ reverse itself? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what we're only looking is for is an independence because uh, by experience in the past, no, uh, these, are really, these are really being used to, to whoever sits there. It's not only the present administration. Whoever sits there in power, it can be, it can be used against their political opponents. Okay. Congressman Hataman, uh, do you have some insights to that question? I think I agree with Anoy. I agree with... Uh... The lawyer from CHR. Remember Irwin that. Uh, hello? Irwin, Irwin, Irwin. Attorney Irwin. Irwin. I agree with Attorney yes, Irwin. Remember that um, those compositions of the ATC are political appointees. So it's very dangerous. It might be politicized not only for this administration or whoever administration comes uh, later. So it's very dangerous. Why not uh, let independent courts or anybody to designate uh, who are terrorists or who is terrorist? This one is a related question to that. And I think it's coming from the heels of our experience of the war on drugs from Jojo Australia. How can we trust the government now not to abuse the terror bill when we have seen human rights violations committed by the law enforcers? We've mentioned something about the, the checks and balances and the safeguards. So maybe we can emphasize that uh, some more, Attorney uh, Irwin. Or Congressman, how can we trust the government not to abuse the terror bill? May I abstain from answering? Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> no, okay, okay. He, okay. He, he responded to oh. his own question, actually. Mm -hmm. And then I think this one is from our guest from um, overseas, uh, Virgis Tirumala. With emerging terrorism threat across our region and other regions, video and audio analytics with AI is addressing this issue of people's expression when entering an area. This helps enforcement authorities. The point is, electronic security system is evolving fast, but the most security personnel are not equipped to manage manage it. There is a need to enhance such skill to security personnel. It's a huge vacuum. I think especially in the Philippines, this also resonates as uh, 
not everybody has the same amount of resources to spare in terms of preventing such acts. Okay, there's a comment. Yes, the trust question was a rhetorical one. Got it. Um, I'm seeing several others. Those of you who would like to engage directly with our speakers, please raise your hand so we can call you and um, um, get your opinions. There was also another comment from um, somebody and course through Slido. This one is directed to attorney Blanca Flor. Was the HSA of 2007 difficult to implement when it was passed? Maybe also our speakers can share their insights into that question. Was the Human Security Act of 2007 difficult to implement? Uh, even in the passage itself, it was already uh, difficult. As a matter of fact, the point raised by Attorney Irwin or the definition of, of terrorism, we, we, we brought in three specialists from the United Nations who actually said and told the senators that there is no definition of terrorism. So, but this bill right now improves the HSA and I am really happy for that because the normal way of doing things is if you cannot define, you enumerate. And that's what happened in HSA. Here, it's now defined. It's a better uh, version. Was it implemented? Yes. There was a, uh, uh, a bombing threat against a bus company. I think it's Kidapawan. I, I could be corrected. We were able to convict the, uh, the, the threat where the threat came from, the, the bomber, and uh, the 500,000 a day penalty was not was not a deterrent. I, I think the problem with the with this law right now and even the previous law, mm -hmm. there's so much uh, disincentive for the law enforcers. I have never seen a penal law that has more warnings and threats against the police officer, against the military personnel. Okay. Thank you, sir. Also, in the on the earlier discussion on how fast it was uh, done in the house. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, in fairness to the lawmakers, after the HSA in two thousand seven was passed, several versions, several bills were filed, both in the House and in the Senate, starting 2010. So this debate has been ongoing for the last 10 years. This has reached committee levels. This has, this has been extensively uh, discussed. But I would just like to share with you what happened in Australia. The Australian Parliament was in recess. It was the Melbourne Cup. It's a very important activity in, in in Australia, and everybody was on holiday. Yet the, the Australian Parliament met on one day just to provide an amendment on their anti-terror law. And because of that amendment, it saved Australia from a very, very potent and imminent attack. So I, I think in fairness to the congressman, they've been talking about this for the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think, I, uh, Professor, uh, yes, yes, Congressman. No, just, just a quick reaction. No? Uh, in, you know, in Australia, they have a very strong law enforcement policy. But at the same time, they have a very comprehensive program to address terrorism, which is absent in our Human Security Act. Okay, noted, Congressman. <laughs> Um, there, I think Professor Banlawi has joined our webinar. Uh, there are several questions. I'm going to read those from Slido. First, uh, uh, this one was straight, we, we mentioned earlier. I understand that there are safeguards for unwarranted arrest, such as those that you mentioned. However, why are they not indicated in the AT law? Uh, do I have to answer that question? <laughs> well, these are the questions, and um, well, let's, it's yeah. a free discussion. It's directed yeah. yeah. at you, sir. But they are in fact provided for uh, in the anti terrorism law, the human rights safeguard when it comes to. But, Professor Banlawi? Uh, uh, 
uh, blessed arrest. It's provided for under the uh, anti-terrorism law. So when you when uh, law enforcers, yes, go ahead, yes. Medyo Hello? choppy po yung internet connection, sir. You're breaking up. Hello? Yes. Uh, okay, there, can you better, hear me now? Better, better. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay. First, on the warrantless arrest, uh, the anti-terrorism law provides provisions for human rights safeguard. Uh, no law enforcement authorities can issue a warrant of arrest without the authority of the Anti-Terrorism Council. And... Um, and in the execution of the warrantless arrest, law enforcement authorities are required to notify the, the nearest court in order to make sure that the rights of the suspects are protected. And also, uh, copy furnish the oh, sorry, notification, sorry. the Anti-Terrorism Council and the Commission on Human Rights. So those are the uh, human rights safeguards. And uh, also written in the anti-terrorism law that during the time of preventive uh, detention, use of torture and coercion will be prohibited. And if law enforcement authorities are caught violating this uh, provision, will be penalized for a period up to 10 years of imprisonment. So those are the... The, the safeguards for uh, warrantless arrest. And the main purpose of extending this warrantless arrest from three days to uh, more than days is for purposes of prevention to allow law enforcement authorities to have more uh, time to gather information and at the same time to hold the suspect uh, if uh, applicable criminal laws cannot be charged for various reasons. So those are the uh, considerations. And uh, this preventive detention period is a practice even among democratic countries in the world. So, uh, so uh, there's uh, enough uh, human rights safeguards for that. And even the Commission on Human Rights is also empowered to monitor the, the, the whole process. There's a follow-up question to that. Will there be another party looking out for human rights aside from the Council and the NICA? Uh, aside from the Council and the Commission on Human Rights, then uh, uh, the families can also uh, 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 monitor the, uh, uh, if there is a human rights violation. And even the civilian uh, institutions of government, the Joint Oversight Committee, can be a platform for that. And if a suspect has some uh, uh, grievances, then we have existing laws to uh, to uh, apply, and uh, if uh, eventually if the suspect is proven uh, innocent, then the suspect has the right to claim for damages, okay, and grievance. So, uh, in my understanding, as uh, a scholar who followed the drafting of this law from the very very start, uh, enough human rights safeguards. Uh, was uh, given in order to make sure that the right to life, liberty, and property of the Filipino people will not be uh, violated. So, uh, in fact, that this law was also crafted by a lot of lawyers, you know, assisting Senator Rapping Lacson and assisting uh, several uh, congressmen. Yeah. Okay. There's this one question. Maybe uh, Professor Banlawi or Congressman can answer this. Why was the organization of the ATC changed to include? The DSWD, the CHED, and the DOTR, etc. Because in the anti-terrorism law, there is a very important provision, which I think the the most innovative uh, provision in the anti-terrorism law that cannot be found in the Human Security Act of 2007 is the program on countering and preventing violent uh, extremism in order to address all the underlying conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. And what are these? Uh, the issue of discrimination, good governance, and addressing the issue of prolonged armed conflict in the Philippines. And uh, for this process to be implemented, we need the, we need the DSWD to uh, address all the social uh, issues associated with the uh, uh, spread of violent extremism, I and mean, even the, uh, the Department of Education, particularly in, uh, in uh, spreading the culture of peace and spreading the culture of uh, nonviolence. I think that is the most innovative provision of the anti-terrorism law, the provision of countering and preventing violent extremism addressing not only 
problems of terrorism when acts are committed, but even uh, focusing more on prevention. No. Excuse me. Preventing, yeah. Hello? Oh, go yeah. ahead, Congressman. Quick question. Okay. Alam mo, yung binabanggit ni Prof. Van Looy, wala yan sa provision. Meron yan PCBE, pero very broad and very general. Yung mga kinukwento niya ngayon na merong programa na ganito, wala akong klaro doon. In fact, uh, Prof, yan yung nire-raise ko sa committee. But because they adapted the Senate version, yung binabanggit niyo, wala yan doon. So, um, Congressman, for the... For the benefit of those who are participating from other countries, can you yeah, repeat I, sorry, that statement? Sorry. I, I mean, the one that uh, mentioned the details by Prof. Van Looy is not present in the, uh, in the Human Security Act of 2020. In fact, I raised that in the committee level because I filed a bill purposely for program against violent extremism. When, when the Human Security Act of 2020 presented to the committee, I proposed to put that provision in, in the bill, they put it in one paragraph very broad, very general, just saying that PCBE, blah, blah, blah. But there is no detailed program as what Prop Van Looy is mentioned. Remember, okay. this is policy. No, This is policy. This is not just a statement. This is a law. So, can, I, can, can I answer it? Can I answer it? Yeah. Hello? Oh, go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's very clear in the new anti-terrorism law the need to counter and prevent violent extremism. However, the detail on how the on how the provision will be implemented cannot be found in the law, but can be found in the national action plan to counter and prevent violent extremism being prepared by the National Security Council with the support of the United Nations Development Program. Uh, it's a UNDP uh, funded. And problem, uh, the only problem, Congressman, with that uh, uh, national action plan, it has not been properly disseminated to the wider stakeholders. And I think our it's high time for our government to make this national ac action plan known to all stakeholders of uh, peace and uh, in, in the Philippines. So that's the, the main uh, problem. But we have existing... Uh, program, the National Action Plan to counter and prevent violent extremism. And that will implement in detail the, the intention of the anti-terrorism bill to have the what we call the uh, PCBE program. Uh, uh, prop, prop, Go just ahead, to uh, inform you, we were part of the National Action Plan activities when I mm -hmm. was the regional governor <coughs> of ARMM. In mm -hmm. fact, we inputted a lot of uh, uh, activities based on our experience in Basilan. But the National Action Plan were uh, developed prior to the approval of the bill. But that's what, right, that's what, right, that's um, right. What I am saying, if we have this action plan, we must have a very clear policy. If the question is, because the National Action Plan is just a plan, it depends on whose administration and what are their priorities. But what we need institutionalized policy that we gave weight to the PCVE program. That's what I, think, I meant. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you absolutely, Congressman. That is why it's very important that people like you should uh, strongly lobby for the rightful uh, implementation of that uh, action plan. And if there's a need to uh, improve the, uh, the plan, then uh, I think uh, we need to uh, engage each other and I, this is my observation about the national action plan security private security professionals uh, are not in fact uh, strongly involved in the in the process and a uh, group like uh, Asian Associates should uh, actively take part in the implementation and even improvement of this national action plan so I agree with you congressman uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, this anti-terrorism law is not only addressing actual acts of terrorism, but also trying to address the underlying conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. And for me, that's a very beautiful provision of the uh, anti-terrorism uh, law that cannot be found in the Human Security Act of 2007. But, Prof, what were you mentioning is not part of the law. The... 
countering and preventing violent extremism. No, there is a paragraph, but what yes, you mentioned, a, yes, the detail is not part of uh, the law. I just want to make it clear. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I was the proponent of that law when the, yeah. uh, when the, uh, when the House bill in the lower house has ano, uh, discussed, has been discussed. Uh, I will uh, read the provision I am now uh, uh, looking for the... Now, there is a provision, but what you're yeah. mentioning, the program, is not part of the law. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But there's a provision of PCBE. Yeah, there is PCBE provision, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, very good. We can take advantage of that provision Wally. to come out with a national policy to counter and prevent violent extremism. Okay. Uh, this one, um, I think, is more directed about the, the presentation of Sir Ace. What is the difference between terrorism and act of war? This is from Aguila Salvacion. Well, that's also my question. And I think uh, Magila or Tokayo Ace is just. Uh, Amplifying it and raising it to the to the to the audience now and to everyone. What is the difference between act of war and terrorism? Because uh, I think this is a very critical question for us in the Philippines to to ask: Why are we comparing ourselves to countries like, say, Germany, Australia, other countries, if they don't have the problems with insurgency and uh, secessionists, no, and even groups like Abu Sayyaf? They may have there in, in Indonesia, in the Malaysia, but then they don't have the, that combat uh, environment than us. So I think Professor Banlaw, you was yeah, I mean, I answered that question. Yeah, yeah you've been studying yeah. 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 For, uh, for long, no? Yeah. Can I answer the question? Yeah, please, please, Professor. Okay. In the act of war, the parties concerned are combatants, you know, the armed, armed forces. So you are targeting specifically armed forces and uh, that kind of uh, activities are guided by the international humanitarian law. However, act of terrorism also targets civilians and even non-combatants. So that's the difference between uh, terrorism and act of war. Act of war involving only combatants. You know, armed forces of both parties or parties concerned. But in terrorism, terrorist groups also target non combatants, particularly civilians. So that's the main difference. So if you, if an, if an armed force uh, deliberately tar targets a civilian, then it will be punishable under existing international humanitarian law. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the answer. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, the question now, uh, Professor Malawi and to other uh, co-speakers, was that what is really the, the ATB now? Is it really against uh, a particular group? Or it is really in terrorism and in particular in terrorism that is not really looking at the, at the victims no? from the point of view of victims, that they are victims of the NPA, they are victims of Abu Sayyaf, they are victims of bombing. But the question is that, Right now, if you look at the uh, areas in uh, Europe, even in Paris, a lot of the terrorism, the acts there are practically using knives, using vehicles. Not no, there's no more use of uh, uh, rifles, uh, machine guns, or bombs. So I think the dynamics will really change now because the question always in my mind is that how is this bill going to cover planning, execution, using the cyber world? Because if it's not covered here, and then how do we prove now that uh, planning it or having using cyber uh, connectivity might be really a, a very gray area? May, may I say something on that? Yes, please. Yes, Prof. Okay. In the when we conducted a uh, study group prior to the drafting of the anti-terrorism bill, this is what uh, this is a. Uh, our understanding. This new anti-terrorism law will target individuals and organization openly advocating the use of violence and openly pursuing acts of terrorism as enumerated in the, in, the, in the law. And acts of terrorism do not only include actual acts but also preparatory actions like planning, uh, financing, training, 
and recruitment and others. So uh, those things, even uh, even inciting to terrorism will be uh, covered by the anti-terrorism law because the main intention of this law is not only to counter actual acts of terrorism, but also to prevent actual acts of terrorism to happen. That is why it broadens the, the, the definition and criminalizes those acts uh, of terrorism. And uh, the reason for doing that is that our existing revised penal code cannot, can, can only try individuals involved in such acts by using ordinary criminal uh, charges. But acts of terrorism is a special crime that requires a special law. And that is why we come out with this law, the anti-terrorism law. So its intention is not only to counter actual acts of terrorism, but to prevent acts of terrorism before it happened, before they happen. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir Rick Blanca Flor, you were raising your hand. You are yeah, there. Yes, uh, just two very short points. Uh, Section 6 of the Cybercrime Prevention Act uh, specifies that you can file and use the cybersecurity law uh, to pursue a crime committed under a special law. Like in this case, the uh, if it becomes a law, the anti-terror. So you can use the Cyber Crime Prevention Act. Now, um, on the definition of, of terrorism, this is this version now that we see is so much a big improvement from the previous. And I'd just like to reassure everyone, planning in itself is not a crime. It's like intellectual property in, in, in copyright, you know, just thinking of idea doesn't give you the intellectual property. You have to execute that idea. So if you look at the wordings of the, of the bill right now, it says planning and defines and it uses the word end. Basic statutory construction dictates that the entire, uh, the entire action must be taken into account and not just planning. So it must have also execution. Thank you, sir. Sir Alex Pama, you were raising your hands earlier. Sorry, I failed to call you. Uh, no problem. Um, I, I just wanted to ask Professor Banlawi. Uh, Romel, kumusta ka na? Sir, kumusta uh, po, sir? Mabuti po. <laughs> okay naman. You, you, you made a statement earlier that one of the reasons that the, um, the, uh, the anti-terrorism bill was ex uh, expanded because to, to address this in a comprehensive way, that's why Kastama in the OTR, and, and uh, the SWD. One short question. Is the uh, um, Department of Finance a member of the ATC in this bill? Uh, I need to check because member. I only know that they are members. Can, can you check that? member and Department of Finance. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, okay. So it's not in my fingertips. That, that yeah. makes a big difference now because in the, the, in the statement that I made earlier in, in, in the, the chat, um, the, the freezing of the assets of the, the, the companies who are suspected to be part of a planning and action group for terrorism uh, for a certain number of times, it will have a very, very significant effect on the business itself, and, and, and uh, especially if they're proven to be um, innocent. And, and um, malaki na yung effect to eh. And uh, that can be now a disincentive to our business and uh, people to the, the detrimental effect of the economy. So that's only one of the things that um, really, really has to be um, uh, taken into consideration. And I hope uh, this bill will not be called a don't even think it bill. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in the anti terror now, I, I'm now, uh, I have the law with me now. Yeah, the Department of uh, the Secretary of Finance is there and the Director of the Anti Money Laundering uh, uh, Council. Okay. The main purpose of this membership is to focus on the countering the financing of terrorism. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to read this comment from um, arzanielatiao.com. Adding too many cooks will spoil the broth, but that is the simplest generalization to it. Coming from the ground, it's really more on administrative reasons. Making ATC bigger will make, make it cumbersome to wield or act, especially wala namang, there's no budget and, and counterterrorism, which is a greater anchor weighing down this um, whole of government approach. So anybody can care to comment? 
from what I gathered from that insight, it appears that because of the so many people inv involved in actually uh, operationalizing this particular law, uh, it might make it even more complicated to actually make any difference in um, how we make sure that terrorism is addressed. Well, ano lang, um, konti, correction lang. Ang DSWD and DOTRN said is not part of ATC. Oh, yeah, wala, wala, uh, wala. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 okay, to clarify, the DSWD, yeah. Congressman, yeah. DSWD, and, uh, DOTR, and CHED are not part of ATC. Oh, it's not part of ATC, part. Office of the Secretary, NSA, then uh, DOJ. Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Yeah, Finance, Secretary Foreign Affairs. Secretary of National Affairs. Defense. ILG, yeah. Finance, Justice. Ang, na, <coughs> ang NICA, actually, they are just part of the secretary. They are the head the of the secretariat. NICA is the secretariat. Yes, that's right. That's right, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman, mm -hmm. for bringing that up. Can we clarify, Congressman? So the members are? Uh, the Office of the Executive Secretary. The Executive Secretary is the chair. Then the NSA is the vice chair. Vice then chair. the member is the finance, uh, DILG, DOJ, and... Uh, DND. Defense. DND, yeah, and DND. DICT. 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 And That's the composition ALC. of the ATC, main ATC. Then yes. they, uh, there is the secretariat. They call it ATC, uh, Anti Terrorism Project uh, Program Management Coordination. And DOTR and DSWD are part of it. DMC. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, certainly makes uh, of all of our conversations moving forward even more interesting. So there's this one um, question from Eugene Gonzalez. Does the law lose its utility when a terrorist act takes place, especially one with profound impact like the one that happened in the US, the 9-11? What's the question? And Does the law lose its utility when a terrorist act takes place, especially like the one in the U.S., the 9-11 attack? No, if, if, if you are involved in the commission of that act, then the law will run after you for committing such acts. And not only those who committed such acts, but also those involved in the planning, uh, financing, and, uh, and other acts uh, facilit facilitating the commission of that act. Yeah. So it will not lose its utility. The law will be applied for the commission of the acts of terrorism. Okay. And the I penalty, see. the penalty, if you are actually involved in the commission of an act of terrorism, the penalty is uh, life imprisonment without the benefit of parole. And if you are also found guilty of facilitating the commission of act of terrorism, the, the penalty will be up to 12 years of imprisonment. Okay. Thank you, sir. I see Sir Hermie Colina is raising his hand. Sir Hermie, go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, Hermie Colina here. I have uh, two questions, actually. The first one um, relates to the status of Jose Maria Sison. Uh, we are all aware that uh, he heads the uh, CPPNPA, and in fact, he is listed as a specially designated national by the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the U.S. Department of Treasury, which means that anyone who is on that list, the SDN list, if you are, in, if you will engage in any business of the, any person in that list, then you will be held liable by under U.S. law. Now, my question is that will the law now require Joma Season? to go back to the Philippines because it would be the height of contradiction if at the moment, because he is on refugee status, that we have a terrorist who is a refugee in the Netherlands. My second question is an offshoot to uh, Sir Alex Palmer's uh, issue on um, companies. Will the AMLAC also have a similar list as the OFAC list or the uh, specially designated national, or in our case, the specially designated individuals who are supporting the terrorist organization, that we will have that list so that any company in the Philippines will not be dealing with these people or companies for that matter. And, and, and lastly, I did a, um, a research on the, uh, I, I went on the uh, global terrorist database just for the perspective of everyone 
between 2010 and 2016, there were about 1,400 terrorist incidents in the country. Between 2016 and 2018, there were 976 terrorist incidents. These terrorist incidents were both perpetrated by Abu Sayyaf and the New People's Army. So you just have to do the perspective why we need to amend this law, given the number of incidents that have been committed. Thank you for that, sir. To our speakers. Anybody, anybody would like to comment or? Uh, can I answer the question? Yeah. One more question. Okay. Uh, well, once this law is approved and signed. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Once this law is signed. Uh, Professor, you're breaking up. Once this uh, and Joma season, uh, the measure is signed into law, and Jose Maria season continues to advocate uh, violence and expresses its support to the activities of the New People's Army, he will be liable to the law. He will be answerable to the law. But however, uh, he, with the uh, implementation of this law and Joma season, starts to withdraw its support to the New People's Army, then that's a good thing. Because this law will run after not only well-known terrorist organizations like Abu Sayyaf Group or Ansar Khalifa Philippines or any pro-ISIS uh, elements in the country, it will also run after individuals and organizations propagating and even supporting acts of terrorism. Thank you, uh, Professor Badlawi. So I think we have uh, reached the uh, last of our question and answer section. Guys, those who are still having some insights or questions, we will try to copy these questions and raise them to the speakers who might be able to provide the best answers. But unfortunately, we need to give time to our speakers to give their last words. So let's start with uh, Congressman Hataman. Please, your last words to our uh, audience. Okay. Um, Wally, thank you for this opportunity. No? Again, I would like to express uh, so much thanks to the organizer of this uh, Zoom forum and likewise to other resource person. But let me put it on record that um, we are all in one. No? We have to fight terrorism and we have to end terrorism. But for me, uh, we need a more comprehensive anti-terror law or Human Security Act. Although that is not uh, infringing the rights of our people, but more protection for them. That is the intent of the law, which is not uh, found in the, uh, in the provision of the law. For example, what is the reason? In fact, I, uh, I want to ask, but later I will text uh, Prof. Banlawi. What is really the reason why we deleted Section 50 of Human Security Act of 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Attorney Erwin Kaliba from the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, yes, Wally. Uh, thank you for inviting us, inviting CHR to uh, uh, participate in this discussion online. Thank you to ACES and Associates. Uh, our, our main point is really, uh, we, we are one in, in fighting terrorism. As I said earlier, uh, the landscape has already changed. What we're only asking is, uh, we can, can we put uh, more safeguards to, to protect uh, individuals' civil and, civil and political rights, such that uh, both are respected in our fight in terrorism. Uh, th there may be some restrictions in, along the way, but it has to be uh, in compliance to the standards of uh, legitimate purpose, proportionality and necessity, uh, principle of legality. Thank you very much and uh, good note to everyone. Professor Balawi. Yes, uh, I'm very happy to uh, engage uh, Congressman Hataman and uh, our friend from the Commission of Human Rights, Attorney uh, Erwin, and uh, thank you, Ace, for this uh, opportunity. The Office of the President is now scrutinizing the 
proposed measure. Now, if you if there are some doubts about uh, human rights uh, protection, I think this is the time for uh, human rights organization and uh, human rights uh, advocates to make their positions known to the president for consideration. Now, if this law is signed, uh, uh, there is still a a remedy for other groups who continue to oppose this bill to challenge the constitutionality of this law before the Supreme Court. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, having uh, participated in the early uh, uh, early discussion groups for the drafting of this law, in my opinion, there are enough human rights protections in this law. In fact, the main intention of this law, as cited in the Declaration of Policy, is in fact to protect the life, liberty, and property of the Filipino people against threats of terrorism. And without note, thank you very much to all, and I look forward to more engagement uh, with you. And if you have questions about, about uh, terrorism-related issues, please visit our website www.pipbtr.org where you can freely download many knowledge products for to raise our awareness on the issue. Thank you very much at mabuhay po kayo. Sir Ish? I'd like to thank first of all uh, Congressman Mujib for uh, accepting my invitation and to uh, Attorney Erwin, thank you for uh, gracing the occasion. No? And uh, Professor Balawi has been a partner in this one. Just like to inform all the speakers that uh, there are some people who are asking me why we have uh, this uh, this mix of speakers, and I think it's because we want to see all the sides of the the bill. You know? For us in the private sector, we really we feel that uh, we're not consulted. We think that uh, we are the ones that will be affected because uh, in the private sector we stay here for a long time, while those colleagues in the service, they might stay only maximum of two years in one position. They are there in one area for, for one uh, term only. And even the ATC and uh, other government uh, offices are there during the tenure of uh, the president, no, or the current administration. But the bill, if they pass into law, will be there forever. So the question always in my mind is that, are we addressing the narratives? Are we addressing that we're nipping from the bud, no? the root cause of all these uh, uh, protests, all these um, secessions, all this terrorism planning and execution? I think that uh, the point of uh, Congressman Mujib that there should be more on the countering the political violence no? and extremism because that's the root cause. Otherwise, when I was with when I was still in the army, I don't really subscribe that we have to kill the NPAs because one, if you kill one NPA, there might be 10 other children who will rise up against the government. So if we address the, the, the conversion of those um, NPAs in the field, there will be 11 and 12, probably including the mother, going back into the fold of the law. But I think that's my personal point based on my experience. But the same thing also with going back to the private sector. We are always the one that is left victimized or affected. And it is our business that is disrupted. But whether there's a disaster, a tragedy, a terror attack, the business, the businesses grind so hold. The government still functions. It has been shown here during the pandemic that companies stop, they stop hiring people, they stop giving salaries, but everybody in the government still gets their pay. They still get the salary. So I think these are one of the contexts that we have to look at. If we have some motives, there are nice purpose. Now, don't get me wrong. I am an, an anti-terrorist guy, terrorism guy, but we have to look at it from a wider and deeper perspective. I, we are so thankful in this uh, webinar series that uh, we're the presence of uh, Director Rick Bangaflor, uh, Yusek, uh, Alex Pama, uh, a lot of uh, senior officers here, from the, even from somebody from the uh, banking sector, from the government offices. We really want a mix of uh, opinion that, and then the, uh, being digested here. And I'm so grateful that uh, the House Speaker, Mujib, you, sir, you really stayed for a long time with us. 
and I'm so thankful for everyone who stayed with us also. So thank you, Ali, for all the, for emceeing this, and uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, there you have it, our speakers for the second leg of our anti-terrorism lecture series. Uh, stay uh, connected with Security Matters for additional announcements about part three. Hopefully, the announcements will be made available soon. So, guys, thank you for participating and keep the conversations going. We need all of us to take part in this very important undertaking. Have a nice day. Happy Independence Day, everybody. Stay safe. Again, the recording of our uh, lecture this morning will be shared through the Security Matters Facebook page and links will be shared to those who have registered through your respective email addresses. Some of the questions that were not answered today, we may be able to uh, pick up on them in our next lecture series. Thank you very much, everybody. Again, we'd like to thank our co-organizers, ACE and Associates, Security Matters, Arslan, uh, SRS Security, Brazilian PH, and the Philippine Institute for Peace, Violence, and Terrorism Research. Maraming salamat, Ace. Congratulations. Uh, well done, well done. Uh, Thank you, sir. Happy tayo. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> game, game. Okay. Uh, may tinext ako sa iyo, no, Ace. Uh, anyway, uh, mukhang pwede na. Mukhang halap tayo dyan ng uh, may one meter distancing. That's a puffy. Oh, sir. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, congratulations. Ano? It was uh, really, really a very good uh, ano? Uh, forum. Uh, at least um, discussions were coming from all sides. And then and, and, um, I, I, I suggest do more of this. Uh, yes. Ma malaking bagay. Uh, ano? Pati si Sir Hermi Colina, nandiyan eh. Yes, yes sir. sir. Always present, si Sir Hermi. Always present. Idol ko yan. <laughs> Come on, ABB. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you, sir. Until next time, uh, happy independence, everybody. Stay safe, yes, sir. Thank you, po. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay.